Chapter 11, Flinching. Early the next morning, we left Wisconsin and drove on, eating up the road through the lower rim of Minnesota. The land here was hilly and green, forests tucked in close beside the road from time to time, and the air smelled of pine. At last, Graham said, some scenery. I love a place that has scenery, don't you, Chickabitty? I had not said anything about what had happened the day before, about being scared down to my very bones when I thought they had left me. I don't know what came over me. Ever since my mother left us that April day, I suspected that everyone was going to leave, one by one. I was glad to be able to go on with Phoebe's story, because when I was talking about Phoebe, I wasn't thinking about too much else. I wasn't thinking about uh, the cars barreling past us at 65 miles an hour. I wasn't thinking about Dad and Margaret. I was trying to think about I was trying not to think about my mother, but often, when I talked about Phoebe, I saw my mother's face behind the things I was saying. Did Phoebe get any more messages? Graham asked. She did. The following Saturday, Phoebe and I were going to Mary Lou's again. As we left Phoebe's house, there, were, there on the front steps was another white envelope with a blue sheet of paper inside. The message was, everyone has his own agenda. Phoebe and I looked up and down the street. There was no sign of the message lever. We weren't, in, we weren't entirely sure what agenda meant, but we looked it up at Mary Lou's. Mary Lou thought the messages, this one and the other one, were intriguing. How exciting, she said. I wish someone would leave me messages. Phoebe thought the messages were spooky. I, it was not the words that bothered her. There was nothing too frightening there. It was the idea that Someone was sneaking around and leaving them on Phoebe's porch without see anyone seeing who this person was. She worried that someone was watching their house, waiting for the right moment to leave the message. Phoebe was a champion warrior. After we looked up agenda, we tried to figure out what the message meant. Okay, Phoebe said, an agenda is a list of things to be discussed at a meeting. So, maybe it's for your dad, I suggested. Does he go to meetings? Well, I guess, Phoebe said. He's ever so busy all day long. Maybe it's from his boss, Mary Lou said. Maybe your father hasn't been conducting his meetings very well. My father is ever so organized, Phoebe said. What about the other message, Mary Lou said. What was that one again? Don't judge a man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. I know what it means, I've said. I've heard my father use it lots of times. Oh, really, Phoebe said. I used to imagine that there were two moons sitting on a pair of Indian shoes, but my father said it means that you shouldn't judge someone until you've walked in their moccasins, until you've been in their shoes, in their place. And your father says this often, Phoebe said. I know what you're thinking, I said, but my father isn't creeping around leaving those messages. It isn't his handwriting. When Ben came into Mary Lou's room, she asked him what he thought it meant. He took a sheet of paper from it, her desk and quickly drew her a cartoon. It was a little spooky because what he drew was almost identical to what I used to imagine a pair of Indian moccasins with two moons in them. Maybe, Mary Lou said to Phoebe, your father is being too quick to judge people at work. He needs to walk in their moccasins first. My father does not judge too quickly, Phoebe said. You don't have to be defensive, Ben said. I am not getting defensive. I am just telling you that my father does not judge too quickly. Later, we went to the drugstore. I thought it was going to be only me and Phoebe and Mary Lou going. But by the time we left the house, we had accumulated Tommy and Dougie as well. At the last minute, Ben said he was coming too. I don't know how you can stand it, Phoebe said to Mary Lou. Stand what? Phoebe pointed to Tommy and Dougie, who were running around like wind-up toys making aeroplane and train noises and zooming in between us and then running up ahead and falling over each other and crying and then leaping back up again and socking each other and chasing after bumblebees. Oh, I'm used to it, Mary Lou said. My brothers are always doing beef-brained things. Ben walked right behind me all the way, which made me a little nervous. I kept turning around to see what he was doing back there, but just strolling along smiling. Tommy bashed into me, and when I started to fall backwards, Ben caught me. He put his arms right around my waist and held on to me, even after it was obvious that I was not going to fall. I could smell that funny grapefruit smell again, 
and feel his face pressed up against my hair. Let go, I said, but he didn't let go. I had an odd sensation, as if a little creature was crawling up my spine. It wasn't a horrible sensation, more light and tickly. I thought maybe he dropped something down my shirt. Let go, I said, and finally he did. It was at the drugstore that I got a little scared. I suppose I had been listening to Phoebe's tales of lunatics and axe murderers too much. Phoebe and I were looking at the magazines when I felt as if someone was watching us. I looked over to where Ben was standing, but he and Mary Lou were busy rummaging around the chocolate bars. The feeling did not go away. I turned the other way around, and there was on the far side of the store was a nervous young man who had come to Phoebe's house. He was at the cash register paying for something, but he was staring at us while he was handing his money to the clerk. I nudged Phoebe. Oh no, she said, the lunatic. She hustled over to Ben and Mary Lou. Look, quick, Phoebe said. It's the lunatic. Where? At the cash register. There's nobody there, Mary Lou said. Honest, he was there, Phoebe said. I swear he was. Ask Sal. He was there, I said. All the way back to Mary Lou's house, we kept turning around and glancing over our shoulders, but there was no sign of the lunatic. We stayed at Mary Lou's for a little longer before we started to pack up. To, uh, before we started back to Phoebe's house. We were only about a block away when we heard someone running up behind us. Phoebe thought we were doomed. If we get our heads bashed in and, and he leaves us here on the sidewalk, she said. I felt a hand on my shoulder and opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. My brain was saying, scream, scream. But my voice was completely shut off. It was Ben. He said, did I scare you? That was not, that wasn't very funny, Phoebe said. I'll walk home with you, he said, just in case there are any, any lunatics around. He had difficulty saying the word lunatic. On the way to Phoebe's house, Ben said some odd things. First, he said, maybe you shouldn't call him a lunatic. And why not, Phoebe said, because a lunatic is, it means, it sounds like, oh, never mind. He would not explain, and he seemed embarrassed to have mentioned this in the first place. Then he said to me, don't people touch each other at your house? What's that supposed to mean? I just wondered, he said, do people go around touching you? No, of course not. I didn't understand what he was getting at. He was staring at me with those round black eyes. I thought so. You flinch every time someone touches you. I do not. You do, he touched my arm. I have to admit it. My instinct was to flinch, but I, cu but I caught myself and pretended not to notice that his hand was resting there on my arm. That creature tickling my spine was back. Hmm, he said, like a doctor examining his, a patient. Hmm. He removed his hand, then he said, where's your mother? I had not mentioned my mother to anyone, not even Phoebe, except for when one time Phoebe had asked about her, and I had only said that she didn't live with us. Ben said, I saw your father once, but I've never seen your mother. Where is she? She's in Idaho. Lewiston, Idaho. What's she doing there? Ben said. I don't really feel like saying. It didn't occur to me to ask him where his mother was. He touched my arm again. When I flinched, he said, ha, gotcha. It bothered me, what he had said. It occurred to me that my father didn't hug me quite so much anymore, and that maybe I was starting to flinch whenever anyone did touch me. I wasn't always like that. Before, before everything went all wrong, we were a hugging family. As I walked along with Ben and Phoebe, I saw a picture in my mind of my mother with her arms around me. I saw another picture of myself when I was three years old. My mother was carrying me on her back up to the barn. My arms were wrapped around her neck and my face was tickled by her hair. Her hair smelled like roses. She licked the skin on my arm and said, um, you're a delicious Salamanca tree. The mo a most delicious Salamanca tree. I saw another vision of myself when I was nine or 10. My mother crawled into bed with me and snuggled close and said, let's build a raft and float away down a river. I used to think about that raft a lot. And I actually believed that one day we would build a raft and float away down a river together. But when she went to Lewis and Idaho, she went alone. Ben touched Phoebe's arm. She flinched. Ha, he said, gotcha. You're jumpy too, freebie. 
and that surprised me. I had already noticed how tense Phoebe's whole family seemed, how tidy, how respectable, and how thumpingly stiff. Was I becoming like that? Why were they like that? A couple of times I had seen Phoebe's mother try to touch Phoebe or Prudence or Mr. Winterbottom, but they all drew back from her. It was as if they had outgrown her. I had been drawing away from my own mother. I'm uh, sorry, had I been drawing away from my own mother? Did she have empty spaces left over? Was that why she left? When we reached Phoebe's driveway, Ben said, I guess you're safe now. I guess I'll go. Go ahead, Phoebe said. We stood there. He stood there. Mrs. Cadaver came screeching up to the curb in her yellow Volkswagen with her wild red hair, witch hair, flying all over the place. She waved at us and then started pulling things out of her car and plopping them on the sidewalk. Who's that? Ben asked. Mrs. Cadaver. Cadaver? Like dead body? That's right. Hi, Sal, Mrs. Cadaver called. She was dumping a huge pile of lumpy bags on the sidewalk. Ben walked over and asked if she wanted any help carrying things inside. My, you're very polite, Mrs. Cadaver said, flashing her wild gray eyes. She scares me half to death, Phoebe said. Phoebe's mother came to her front door. Phoebe, what are you doing? Are you coming in? Who is that? She was pointing to Ben. Phoebe whispered to Ben, don't go inside. Why not, he said rather too loudly, because Mrs. Cadaver looked up and said, why not what? Oh, nothing, Phoebe said. Mrs. Cadaver said, Sal, do you want me to come in? I was just going to Phoebe's, I said, glad for an excuse. Phoebe pulled on Ben's sleeve. What's the matter, he asked. Is something the matter, Mrs. Cadaver said in her cra crackly dead leaf voice. Phoebe, her mother called, sweetie. We left Ben. Just as we were going into Phoebe's house, we turned around and saw Ben lift something off the sidewalk. It was a shiny new axe. Phoebe's mother said, is that Mary Lou's brother? Was he walking you home? Where's Mary Lou? I hate it when you ask me three questions in a row, Phoebe said. Through the window, we could see Ben lugging the axe up the front steps of Mrs. Cadaver's house. Phoebe opened the window and called out, don't go in. But when Mrs. Cadaver held the front door open, Ben disappeared inside. Phoebe, what are you doing? Her mother asked. Then Phoebe pulled the envelope out of her pocket, the envelope containing the latest message. I found this outside, Phoebe said. Mrs. Winterbottom opened the envelope carefully, as if, as if it might contain a miniature bomb. She read it. Oh, sweetie, she said. Who is this from? Who is it for? What does it mean? Phoebe explained what an agenda it was. I know what an agenda is, Phoebe, she said. I don't like this at all. I want, you to, know, I want to know who is sending these. I was waiting for Phoebe to tell her about seeing the nervous young man at the drugstore, but Phoebe didn't mention it. It was with great relief that we saw Ben leave Mrs. Cadaver's house a little later. He appeared to be all in one piece. That day, when I got home, my father was in the garage tinkering with the car. He was leaning over the engine, and I couldn't see his face at first. Dad, what do you think it means if someone touches someone else and the person is being touched flinches? Do you think it means that that person being touched is getting too stiff? I mean, let's say a person didn't use to flinch, but now... Dad turned slowly around. His eyes were red and puffy. I think he had been crying. His hands and shirt were greasy. But when he hugged me, I didn't flinch.